Today's sermon is entitled, Bless the Lord, O My Soul. O my soul, worship his holy name. The passage I've chosen today is Psalms 103. My name is Reverend Derek Gelder, and I'm the senior pastor at McKees Mills Baptist Church, and I want to say a special thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. While some of the Psalms are addressed to God, the righteous, sinners, Israel, Gentile nations, and others, Psalms 103 was written by David to himself. Unlike others, this psalm was not written due to harassment of his enemies or private guilt, but to remind him to always just think about all the wonderful blessings that God has given him. You know, sometimes life gets really hard, and through trials and tribulations, life can really kick you really hard. And it's hard to look at God and say, thank you, Lord, for all the wonderful things that you've given me. David knew it was easy to praise God in the good times, but during trials and tribulations, it's not so easy. And it's certainly not so easy when you're the recipient of God's punishment. Have you ever gone through that? Where God's disciplining you and you know it, you know you've done wrong and God's coming after you and saying, oh, by the way, I want your attention. You got to stop doing this. So I'm going to bring some hardship into your life. Have you ever gone through that? That can be very difficult to jump forward and say, thank you, Lord. You discipline those that you love. To keep from complaining, feeling depressed, or having anger towards God, David reminds himself of the blessings that God has lavished upon him, such as forgiveness, redemption, renewal, compassion, and unending love. These benefits can, of course, be received only by obeying God's word. So there is a catch here. Yes, God will always do good to those that he loves. Absolutely. And yes, God will take care of us. And yes, God will give us all these wonderful blessings. But we have to be faithful and obedient to him. Now, when I say blessings, I'm not talking material blessings necessarily, because often our blessings are in heaven, and sometimes it's hard to see them. But David acknowledges, I've received so very much already in my life. David says, I want to bless God's holy and wonderful name. He cries out with all of his soul in this, in this passage, and he says, my inner being wants to bless, wants to say, blessed are you, Lord. You are awesome and amazing. During difficult times, the children of Israel often gave prayers to God riddled with an attitude of complaint. What would it have been like to witness the ten plagues of Egypt? Due to their fear that Israel numbers had grown way too large and would inevitably result in the Israelite people basically, you know, joining together with the enemies of the Egyptian people and basically conquering them. Due to that fear, Pharaoh decided, you know what, I'm going to take all the Israelite people and I'm going to force them into slave labor. I'm going to work them ruthlessly in hopes that I'll kill as many of them as I possibly could. To see Moses approach Pharaoh and say the infamous words, let my people go, would have been one that would not be easily forgotten. Can you imagine that for a moment? Moses goes up to Pharaoh, who is the king of all of Egypt, and says, God has told me to tell you, let my people go, or you'll suffer the consequences. Let my people go. That would be amazing to be able to go back and actually hear him say those words. Nor, how could one ever forget the ten plagues? that ultimately came to the to Pharaoh, the turning of the water into blood, frogs, lice, flies, diseases, boils, hail, locust, and three days in total darkness, and finally the death of the firstborn. How could we ever forget all of those things happened? Those were true miracles. We are told God delivered the children of Israel with these mighty acts of judgment, and when they left Egypt, Israel re received so many gifts from the Egyptians, it was like they plundered the entire nation. In other words, God encouraged the Egyptian people to look favorably upon the Israelites, to have pity on them, to have compassion towards them, to show them mercy and say, you know what, we haven't really treated them very good since they've been here. Therefore, let's give some of our possessions to them out of respect for them. And they did that. You would think Israel would be eternally grateful and yet at the Red Sea, and at the waters of Mara and Elam, and at the desert of Sin, the children of Israel complained and told God that they wished they had remained slaves in Egypt. Better we be there, they said, where we are alive and we had some food in our bellies, than out here in the desert where we're inevitably, in their minds, we think we're going to die. Notice how we complain so quickly and so easily against God. Look how quickly we, we see all these great and wonderful miracles in our lives. And we're so quick to get that condescending, that, that bitter heart that basically says, Lord, where are you? Why don't you give me more good stuff? Why are you giving me difficult times? This happened to Israel. It certainly can happen to us. Lest we think less of the Israelite people than we ought to, do we not complain to God every time we face difficult times or when we face his punishments? 
When our health fails, our debts overwhelm us, marital relations break down, appliances break, or enemies threaten us, are we not the first to complain to God with hearts filled with depression, or maybe even possibly a little bit of anger towards God? We either sink into depression so deep that it feels like our souls will be forever crushed, or we become enraged at God sometimes for allowing these tragedies to occur in the first place. And what about all those times in which God punishes us? Even though it goes against Scripture, are we not the first to accuse God of not doing good to those that He loves, Romans 8.28, or giving us far more than we can bear? Are not our complaints a subtle attempt to force God to rewrite our story and take out all the bad things in our lives? I got thinking about that. Is that not true? Isn't there many times that we go to God and we complain, I don't like this situation, God. My finances are not very good and, and I, I just I don't know where I'm going to get the next my money to pay off my next bill. And I'm really worried. I'm really concerned, God. And would you would you rewrite my story? And would you would you take all my financial concerns away from me? Or maybe we've got some kind of ailment and we're saying to God, you know what? I want you to rewrite my story. I want you to, to fix me and to heal me. There's nothing wrong with asking for these things. And in many cases, God will grant them to us. But sometimes we have to be patient and sometimes we have to persevere through difficult times. And if God ever did choose to rewrite our story and remove all the difficult times out of our lives, then how would we ever mature in the faith? In James uh, 1, 2 to 4, it says, you know what? We're going to face trials and tribulations as Christians. And it's by facing those trials and tribulations and by persevering that ultimately our faith grows. If we don't go through difficult times, our faith never grows. You see, when you go through hardships and you make it through it because God helped you to make it through it, then you have more faith. You know that next time God can help you through that problem again, or it may be even a more difficult one. To keep from complaining or being angry at God, we need to be like David and choose to combat these sinful attitudes with one of praise for all the glorious benefits that God has already given us. And that's where we're going to go in the sermon now. We're going to look at four of these wonderful benefits. But first, before we do that, let's turn to the passage that David is talking about here. Psalms 103, 1-2. This is David. Remember again, this is his uh, prayer to God to remind himself to always praise God. Listen to what he says. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my innermost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all of his blessings. In the opening of this Psalms, David is rousing himself to shake off apathy or gloom of his circumstances by remembering the benefits he's already received from God. We often falsely assume that praise to be genuine must be spontaneous. But here we learn that the self can be commanded to exercise itself to confess God's mercy. In other words, what David is doing is trying to force his mind, his soul, his body, everything about him. He's trying to force himself to remember the blessings in order to praise God continuously. For David, this intensely personal question of how he was to praise God properly must encompass his entire being, the totality of his human essence. Nothing else but loving God with all of his heart, mind, and soul, Deuteronomy 6.5, would suffice if it was to be proper thanksgiving. By remembering what the Lord has done throughout history of redemption for creation at large, for the community, and for oneself, David knows that he can thwart a critical and carping spirit to embrace one of reverence and awe and respect for God for all the things that he's done for him, especially for his salvation, Psalm 62.2. The following sections will examine four major benefits that David focuses on and in turn will invite us to count our blessings as well and say, praise be to God. Praise him with all my soul and my inner being. Benefit number one, the forgiveness of sin. Let's look at the passage that David uh, uses here, uh, verses 3 and 12 in particular. Verse number three, praise the Lord who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. And verse number 12, he removes all of the sin as far as the east is from the west. He's removed all of our transgressions from us. I like this little uh, picture here that you see on the screen right now. And it says TGIF. And I've always thought that to be, thank God it's Friday. But uh, in this case here, somebody's reinterpreted that and said, thank God I'm forgiven. And I like that so much better. The first thing David is thankful for is the forgiveness of sins. While David was called a man after God's own heart, 1 Samuel 13, 14, 
and uh, Acts uh, 13.22. He was not without sin in his life. Could David ever forget that he was the one who committed adultery with Bethsaida and had her husband killed? David had much to rejoice in, for God heard David's appeal to his hesed, his love, blotted out his iniquity, and made him whiter than snow, Psalms uh, 51. While we are to thank God for our homes, jobs, wealth, family, and health, Deuteronomy 8, 10 to 14, it is a forgiveness of sins that we should be most thankful for because the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. Having a close personal relationship with God is not possible for those who cherish sin in their hearts because their prayers will not be heard, Psalm 66, 18. Like David, we should be forever thankful that once we confess and repent, God promises to not only forgive, 1 John 1, 9, but also to remove the power and the consequences of our sin by an infinite unimmeasurable distance from us. In other words, he's going to take our sins, all the things that we've done. He's not going to count them against us. Instead, he's going to remove them from us as far as the east is from the west. In other words, an infinite distance. Praise God that he does that. I don't know about you, but I find it very difficult to get through a day without sinning. My mind wanders unto things that my mind ought not to. And to be truthful, there's many times in my life that I say things I shouldn't. I do things that I should not do. And that happens on a daily basis. And as a result of that, I need forgiveness on a daily basis. So every day I repent to God. I say, Lord, forgive me for the sins that I have done. And praise be to God. He removes those sins. He forgets them. He doesn't hold them against me anymore, but he removes them as far as the east is from the west. God is so gracious and wonderful to us. Benefit number two, God shows us compassion and mercy. Let's look at Psalms again, 103, 7 to 10. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. While celebrating God's mercy, David does not ignore the reality of his wrath, but at the same time remembers its delay, temporality, and sparing application. David remembered the time in which the Israelite people had made the golden calf. In response to their sin, God was so angry with Israel that he wanted to destroy them all, Exodus 32:9-10. Even though God struck the people with a plague, Exodus 32:35, he showed them great mercy by forgiving and promising to be present with them as they went into the promised land, Exodus 33. To seal this promise, God made himself known unto Moses at Mount Horeb, Exodus 34:6-7. In writing this passage, David might also have reflected upon his sin with Bethsaida. Due to the sins of adultery and murder, God's anger burned against David, and he was punished by the death of their first child, 2 Samuel 12, 14. God's anger eventually subsided, and he blessed David and Bethsaida with he who would be the wisest human king that ever lived, Solomon, Exodus 12, 24. Now, I want to say the wisest human king. Obviously, Jesus Christ was the wisest king that ever walked on the face of the planet, but he was both God and man. Solomon was the wisest human king ever. And, and this is the blessings that David ultimately got. What David is trying to tell us is that through God, even though he's angry with us from time to time, and he certainly is, especially when we sin, he does not always keep on accusing us, Isaiah 57, 16. He doesn't continue holding a grudge against us or being angry towards us, Isaiah 3, 13, Jeremiah 2, 9, Micah 6, 2. Praise be to God, he doesn't. He has every right in the world to be bitter towards us, every right to be angry and disappointed with us. And his righteousness demands that we die every single time we sin. Praise be to God, he doesn't kill us every time. Because if he did, none of us would be alive. We sin so very much. Praise be to God, he gives us time as well to repent. I'm so thankful that he's given me many times in my life that time in which I get the opportunity to repent and tell him I'm sorry before he decides to punish me. God is so good to us, so compassionate and full of grace. Benefit number three, not punishing us beyond what we can bear. Psalms 103, 14 to 16 says, He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower in the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone and its place is remembered no more. The basis of God's compassion is not to be traced to the golden calf incident alone, but also to the creation narrative. 
He who knit us in our mother's womb, Psalms 139, knows that we are made of the dust of the earth, Genesis 2.7. Fragile and easily broken are these jars of clay, 2 Corinthians 4.7. God knows that he has to show us compassion. He has to show us mercy, for he knows that we're mere dust, not only by constitution, but also by sentence. Because we are like the flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, God tempers his wrath. His discipline will only leave us in pain and terror for a short period of time, lest our head drops and we return to the ground, hence that we came. When God considers our frailty, he pities us and he shows us mercy. He gives us a far greater chance to repent than we deserve, and he wants to forgive us if only we ask. I think that is really a lot of grace. Praise be to God, he doesn't punish us immediately every single time we sin, but instead gives us time to repent and the opportunity to do so, so that we might forego some of that punishment. And when he does punish us, he never punishes us exactly the way we deserve at all. He still shows us grace, even in, our, in his punishments of us. Benefit number four, the ability to be faithful. Psalms 103, verses 13, 18, and 21. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. Praise the Lord, all the heavenly host, you who are his servants who do his will. Compassion from God is contingent upon our response to him. While the greatest performance of man's duty cannot demand the least tokens of God's favor as debt, those who fear God by obeying his commands and desires for their lives will receive his compassion. Fear is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs 1, for God does not promise to show his mercy on those who trifle with him and are spiritually dead inside. To break free from our spiritual lukewarmness like David, we must learn to respond to God's wrath, not with indifference or anger towards him, but a broken heart, willing to submit to his authority over our lives. I got thinking about Proverbs chapter number one. It was written by Solomon. It was meant to be a, a letter, a love letter, but uh, instruction to pass down to all of his children, the next generation and the, and the ones after that. Solomon wanted to tell his children how to lead, lead good and holy and wonderful lives. Solomon was the wisest person on the face of the earth, next to Jesus Christ, of course, and he wanted to pass that wisdom on to his children. So he begins his, his passage, his whole big long letter to them, and he says the very first thing you must keep involved in, you must remember in particular, is fear the Lord. He says it at the front of Proverbs, he says it as the back of Proverbs. In other words, it's incredibly important. When Solomon says this, of course, he's not saying to be scared of God. He's not saying that we should always tremble and be scared of the God at all times and, and live in fear of him. That's not what he's saying. But we should tremble. We should have awe and respect for God. And ultimately, we should be concerned of all the things that he can do to us. God can punish us, and he often does. And when his wrath falls upon us, we cannot stand. We should keep that in mind before we do the sin, when we're being tempted, we should be thinking about these are the things that God could do to me and has done to me in the past because I sinned. And it's through that fear of God that we, we tend to not sin as much. And that's what Solomon told his children. Think about the consequences of what you're about to do. Of course, the most primary reason why we want to obey God is not fear. It's actually love. We want to love God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and we want to please him. That's the number one motivator. But never forget at the same time, we should want to obey him because we don't want his wrath. I got thinking about this. Uh, God has established his throne in heaven, but his kingdom rules over everyone, absolutely everywhere, including us. To be able to submit to his authority means that we must come to no longer perceive God's commands as a burden to us, for John 5, 2, but instead as food, food to keep us alive and healthy inside of God's kingdom and serving him. And even when his will is difficult to follow, I think we got to be like Jesus and say, may your will be done, Luke 22, 42. This is a kind of submission that when given to God results in receiving not only his mercy, but also his blessings. And when I talk about blessings here, I'm not really talking about material ones. Yes, there are times in our lives when God gives us material blessings. He absolutely does. He gives us more wealth. He gives us a nicer home, a nicer car. He gives us, you know, nicer vacations. There's lots of times in which God does choose to do that. But I think the majority of the time, praise be to God, our blessings are in heaven. 
where moth and rust cannot destroy them, where nobody can take them from us, where we get to spend an eternity with those crowns of righteousness. Praise be to God, he does that for us. In conclusion, David asks a really important question, and he answers it, and that is, who ultimately should praise the Lord? Uh, Verses 20 to 22 says, Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly host, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. David concludes this psalm by imploring all in heaven and all of creation to praise the Lord. To praise him properly means to imitate the heavenly heroes who always do his bidding and obey his word and will. While the angels occasionally serve God on earth by doing errands, by fighting battles, or ministering unto the people of this world, they spend most of their time in heaven continually worshiping and praising God's holy name. And that's exactly what we should be doing as well. May all of God's works in which he has dominion over them, in other words, over everything, may everything praise his holy and wonderful name. At this point in the passage, David is overwhelmed with joy that God has compassion on him and has shined his face upon him in the first place. In other words, God never killed him. God didn't strike David dead when he sinned with Bethsaida. He instead, he punished him, yes, but he also, after he was forgiven, after David said, you know what, here's here's all I got to offer you, God. I've got my undying love. I've got a broken heart. I'm sorry for what I did. That's all I can offer you, God. And God said, you know what? That's all I've ever wanted from you. And that's all he's ever wanted from us. He wants our broken heart. He wants to know from us that we're truly sorry for the sins that we are doing. He wants to know from us that we're going to be faithful and we're going to be obedient and we're going to do his will because we love him. That's what he wants to know from us. And then he forgives us. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness and he blesses us. And I think God is so amazing for doing that. With thanksgiving in his heart for having been forgiven and you not received what he had deserved, all the sins that he had done, David cries out with all of his inner being, praise be to God who is awesome and amazing. Well, I don't think it is possible for a human being to praise God even close to what he deserves. I think we can and we should spend an eternity trying to do so. And I can tell you, I'm so happy that God's forgiven me. And I'm so happy that he's accepted me as one of his children and that he loves me dearly. And yes, I do sin and I sin quite frequently. And I'm so thankful that every time that I do and I ask God to forgive me, he drives my sins as far as the east is from the west away from me. Thank you, God, for that. May we get that kind of thanksgiving inside of our soul, especially when things aren't going well. I'm in the process of trying to sell off uh, a second home. My wife and I took a giant leap of faith, and it was really a big one. We moved closer to the church, and we wanted to be near to the congregation. And we bought a house without selling our old one first. We had the mortgage paid off, but we had some debts behind it. And when we bought this house, uh, we decided, you know what, we're going to sell the old one, and we're going to try to do it quickly. We thought it would go fast, but it didn't. And we are still in the process of trying to sell it 90 days later. And there's bills coming in, and there's debt that's mounting up. But praise be to God that he's going to take care of it. Praise be to God that he's forgiven me. Praise be to God that he has riches in heaven far beyond that house and all the concerns with it. Praise be to God that he loves me. And that's far more important than anything else in my life. So I am so very thankful. I hope and pray when you face difficult times, me, it's my house. Maybe you, it's something else. Maybe it's marital problems, or maybe it's, you know, other kind of financial issues, or maybe you've got some health concerns. May you be like David, and may we both go back and look at all the wonderful blessings we have. And may we, with our inner being, with all that we have, with our heart, mind, and soul, may we praise God for all that he's done for us. Amen and amen.